our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Now, Lord, prepare us to receive the word of God as you speak to us this morning. In your name we pray, amen. You may take your seats. We may not think of it this way, but at least I believe Matthew 10, verse 1, which was just read for us by our deacon, can be one of the most challenging and humbling verses in the Bible. When it says that he called the 12 disciples to and he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. And if you go on later in that chapter in verse 7, he tells us to go and preach the message. And the word preach here does not mean standing behind a pulpit necessarily, but simply going and declaring the truth of Jesus Christ. To declare that the kingdom is near. Freely you receive, freely you give. And I, I read these verses and I'd like to kind of step back from them and say, Lord, well, you know, I can see that you gave these to the 12 disciples. So that's how you wanted them to act. Because I think we can all agree that for most of us, going, having the authority of Christ, driving out evil spirits and healing every disease and sickness isn't a part of our everyday life, right? If it is, please sit down with me and help me and teach me. <laughs> and yet when I look at this and I realize he gave them authority to do this, Last week, our gospel was Matthew 28, which tells us that that authority has been given to every believer. And so when we read that and we read this verse, we're reminded that this is our responsibility is to release the kingdom of God through our lives. Now, I know we can get caught up with heal every disease and cast out demons, but let's just focus on letting the kingdom of God come through our lives to change the world around us. Now, even that sounds so huge and so immense. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at one very vital aspect that has to happen to every believer, somewhat on a regular basis, in order to help us become the men and women of God that he wants us to be. I don't know if we can all agree on it, but I hope most of us can, that the, the, the calling of, of Christianity on the church today is at a subpar level to where God wants us to be. And that is not meant to shame us, I hope, but it's meant to encourage us that there is more that we can accomplish than we've accomplished so far. Isn't that good? Yeah. I mean, not that there's anything wrong. That doesn't diminish what we are doing and what we have done, but to know that there's even something greater. And so I'd like to take a moment... And look at how God explains brokenness. He gives us the illustration of his son through the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah 53. This is what brokenness looks like. Speaking of Jesus, there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his presence. Nothing to attract us to him. He was despised. He was rejected. A man full of sorrows. He was acquainted with the bitterness, bitterest grief. 
We turned our backs on him and looked the other way when he went by and he was despised and we did not care. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he didn't open his mouth. From prison and trial, they led him away to death. He had done nothing wrong and he never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and fill him with grief. Yet when his life was made an offering for sin, he would have a multitude of children. And God said, I will give him the honors of one who is mighty and great because he exposes himself to death. What we're going to look at this morning is how God uses the process of brokenness to bring restoration in our lives. And I know when I share that, for many of us, we focus on the word brokenness. And my hope is that, though that's the entry place, that we focus more on the word restoration. Because there's a lot of us that need a lot of restoring in a lot of areas of our lives. And if we feel whole right now, then I can promise you, there are multitudes around us who need this hope of how to find restoration and transformation and even reviving in their lives. Webster's defines brokenness, when I read this, I was like, wow, as a violent separating into parts, a shattering. And as I read that, I was reminded of the newsletter that I sent out to you back in January, which I know you always peruse every week and read through and remember those important points I made. But just in case you've missed this one, let me share with you what I felt the Lord gave to, to me in January to share with you. Finally, I want to share with this out of our newsletter. Finally, I want to share with you a brief thought concerning the spiritual direction God is leading us into for this year. Luke 6 shows us a house that can't be shaken because its foundation is Christ. I believe this year God is going to shake us in two ways. First, to awaken us to move into something greater for CC, for Christ Church Jacksonville. Secondly, to shake out the parts of our lives that are sinful and not in conformity to where God wants us to take wants to take us next. The process may be challenging and difficult, but if it leads us to become both individuals in a church that magnifies him more, then it will be a wonderful thing. When God gave me that word after a, a time of fasting and prayer, I thought that word was just specifically for us. I had no idea that that was for the whole world. I was not prepared for that. I don't want to come off as some great prophet. And I saw it coming. I didn't see anything. <laughs> didn't see anything. I don't, see, I don't know anyone who saw it coming. What God was about to do. But I'm encouraged by this because it means that God is with us in this process. Amen. That though we may not have remembered it, that God gave us a word to remind us that he is our fortress, our strength. And as we move through the different challenges within the past months and the coming months and all that's going to happen. I mean, let's be honest. Do you see our world coming to a relaxed, easy place anywhere before November? For a multitude of reasons, right? And so we as the church are meant to be influencers during this process. But I'm here to tell you that I truly believe that the way we influence the world is the way Jesus showed his disciples, the way God showed his people in the Old Testament. And that's by breaking parts of their lives to bring them into conformity to him. And I'd even go so far as to say that if we are not willing to be broken, we're going to miss out on the res restorative and the reviving process that God wants to do in our lives. And so just for a, a helpful example, I wanted to remind us of both an Old Testament and a New Testament example of this. First of all, we have one that many of us, most of us probably here are familiar with, the story of David. Where, David, where God in his mercy raised David out of being just a, a simple, wonderful shepherd and brought him to be king over all of Israel. But at some point, David started to have pride in his heart and thought that he could lead the kingdom his own way. And through that, God revealed his lust that was within him. His rebellious attitude by allowing him to see this woman, lust after her, go and have adultery with her. And you know the story. Bring her husband in, send him back out, have him on the front line to be killed. In essence, murdering him and then taking this woman as his wife. And God in his mercy sends the prophet Nathan to him. 
Now, when the prophet Nathan came to David, it wasn't like today where, you know, someone has, says I have a prophetic word and I've had people come and give me prophetic words. And I'm like, I think you missed it on that one, bud. <laughs> and then they just walk away. Here, if David didn't like what Nathan was saying, even if he was right, he could have had Nathan executed. And Nathan comes and tells him that God's angry and disappointed in David for what he did. That he had walked away from, from following and being an obedient man after God's heart. And David could have sent him out and said, have him killed. I don't want anyone to know about this. But instead, David allowed himself to be broken. He heard the truth spoken to him. Heard the voice of God through the prophet. And he was broken and he repented. And in the end, it says, David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. In Psalm 51, many of you may be familiar, but some of you might not, is, is David's remembering of his prayer time, his repentance that came out of that time when Nathan rebuked him. And he says, have mercy on me, O God. Because of your unfailing love for me, according to your great compassion, would you blot out my sin? Wash it away. Cleanse me of it. I know my sins and transgressions are before me. Against you I've sinned. So cleanse me. Hide your face from my sins and blot them out. And it's where that great verse comes. Created me a clean heart. O oh God. And then he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And we know throughout the rest of that psalm and we see through David's life that he found that forgiveness. He found that restoration and that joy of the Lord again. You see, when we're unwilling to be broken by God, when he reveals things and we push them aside and we say, I can't deal with that right now. What we're doing is hardening ourselves towards God and we're not able to experience the joy of his salvation. We're not, and God wants us to have that. And so it's his mercy. His breaking of us is his mercy to us. The other example is one that you also might be familiar with. It's the Apostle Paul. It'd be hard to say anyone outside of Jesus had a greater impact for the kingdom of God than the Apostle Paul. And Paul was this, this religious zealot. He was known as someone who, who was persecuting the church because everything he had heard from all the people he respected said that this Jesus was a fool, that he was a liar, that he was trying to, to destroy the Jewish system of worship. And so he had this, this anger and this pride that built up in his heart. And God in his mercy met Paul on the Damascus Road. All of that unforgiveness, all of that anger. And in a moment of seeing Jesus, he was thrown from his horse. He was on the ground and no one else could, could see it. But Paul saw it. Jesus appeared and said, why are you persecuting me? And from that moment on, though blinded in his eyes for a time, his heart had been melted and his spirit made alive. And the very zeal he used to persecute the church. Now that zeal was transformed in a restorative way that he became one of the greatest men of God to walk the earth. Because God had to break him. It wasn't as simple as him hearing a message and coming forward or in a crowd saying, I'll take you Jesus. And then walking away with no impact. His whole life was transformed. When, when his eyes were made open again, the prophet spoke to him and said, you are going to face a world of hurt for following the gospel. But God will keep you strong. And I wish I could say, and that was the one time God broke Paul. But Paul, after many years of ministry, shares with us in 2 Corinthians about a breaking again. And it reminds us that breaking is not a one-time process. Because when God breaks us and reforms us, sometimes we crack again. Amen? And he has to lovingly come. And again, I want us to get that as a believer in Christ, his breaking is a grace. It's a mercy to us because it brings the restoration. And so in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says to keep me from becoming conceited. And you can imagine he could be conceited. This man oversaw all of these churches. His name was either loved or hated throughout the entire huge region. This man was well known. His letters had an impact then and obviously do now. And he said to keep me from becoming conceited. 
because of these great revelations that God is speaking to me. God put a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. God, and he's saying in God's mercy, he allowed me to face torment. We don't think of it that way. That doesn't preach good, does it? Those aren't the kind of things that bring in the big bucks on the, uh, on the TV screen, does it? But that's how Paul understood it. And we don't know exactly what the thorn in the flesh was. Many scholars believe that it, it was a, a group of, of zealot Jewish leaders who would go from town to town and aggressively attack what he was teaching. And it was kind of this thorn in his side. Some people believe it was some kind of physical deformity or problem. People are not sure. But whatever it was, he says, he says I pleaded with God three times to take it away. And if anybody had a prayer life, it was Paul. Amen? Right. And so he pleaded with God three times to take it away. And yet he found grace and peace in the fact that he said, God said to him, I won't take it away. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And then Paul makes this outrageous statement. He says, well, okay, if that's the case, then I'm going to boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. I will handle insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, he makes me strong. And I'm here to tell you that those times that we feel weak and we feel broken and we feel like everything is shattering around us, that is the moment that God wants to come and say, now let me show you the restorative process of brokenness. When he reveals to us those areas and thought patterns we have that are impure, that are sinful, he says, let me come and heal you, forgive you, and restore you to the joy of my salvation. I mean, here's Psalm 34. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 147, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Isaiah 61 Speaking of Jesus, because Jesus will later quote this verse, it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to do what? To proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for those who are captives, and to release from darkness the prisoners. And so if we're someone this morning who has a broken heart, or we feel captive to some sin or some attitude, or we're trapped in darkness, God is saying, I have the answer for you. I am close to the broken hearted. And I want to restore you. Now it's interesting. I thought, I thought of this illustration. Imagine a man who had been denied food for let's say three weeks. He's famished. He feels emaciated. He feels hollow on the inside. And you take him into this giant banquet hall. And we've all been in back all they have the big circle tables, you know, all the way around. And every circle table has a huge amount of food on it. And they, they sit this man down at the, this one circle table with all of this food on it. And they say, this is the best food. This will have the best nutritional value. This will change you by you eating this food. And he sits down and he looks at it. And he starts to look at all the other tables. And he says, I hear what you're saying, but let me go try this one over here. And he goes over here and he, he, he fills up his plate full of this food and he takes it back to the table and he sits down and he rubs his hands and he goes to eat and the food disappears. And he goes, that's kind of weird. So then he goes over to this table over here and he says, I'm going to try this one. He does the same thing, puts the food on, comes back to the table. He sits down. Ah, now I'm ready to eat. Food's gone again. And he tries table after table until finally he remembers what the fellow told him and said, this table I put you at is the one that will feed you and nourish you like no other. And he begins to eat, and he begins to get revived, and he begins to get filled. You see, what we do many times is when we're in this place of anxiety or this feeling of brokenness, we first of all will look to ourselves to try to fix it. That's the one table. We say, I can do this. I can pull myself up, and I can get through this, and I'm going to make it through. And we go, and we'll find out in the end we might have fixed it for a little, but in the big picture it leaves us empty. We might go to counselors or psychiatrists to try to fix it. That's another table. And we come and we sit down and we're about to eat and we realize it doesn't satisfy. Some of us might even look to government organizations or systems or even politicians and go to that table and say, this is what's going to fix things. If this happens, and so I'm going to take it and I'm going to eat it, and it's empty. 
other tables we may go to or churches and pastors to fix us, families and friends to fix us, sports and entertainment to feel the, fill the empty moments trying to cover up the, the broken feelings inside. We can even go as far as to drug or alcohol or pornography or some other kind of rebellion. And I'm not saying in any way that churches and pastors and families and friends and counselors that there's anything wrong with that. But if we look to those things over coming to Christ and letting him deal with us, it will come apart empty inside. All of those other things, minus the alcohol, drugs and all that, all those other things are meant to be conduits to draw us to Jesus Christ. Because when we sit down at his table, what does Psalm 23 say? He prepares a table before me in the very presence of my enemies. And so if we're feeling broken and weak and empty spiritually on the inside, it could be that God is trying to mercifully awaken us. Saying, this is what I need to deal with in you. And you've kind of just said, this is who I am. And he says, I don't want this to be who you are anymore. I want to make you someone different. Jeremiah, if you're familiar with his story, it's a very long book, and so sometimes it's hard to, to follow the whole uh, history of what happened. But he was a prophet sent to the nation of Israel, and, he, and or to, to the people of Judah, and he, he came and he preached, and he preached that the Babylonians were going to come and take and destroy the city of, if, if they didn't repent. He told it to the people, he told it to the religious leaders, he told it to the political leaders, and they all mocked him. They put him in jail, they put him in a pit, they did all kinds of things to him. And yet in the very end, the Babylonians came, as Jeremiah said, because the people did not repent. And they destroyed all of Jerusalem. They took away all of the young men. In fact, remember Daniel. Daniel was probably one of them that they took away in that, that time. And they just left a few of the, the poor and scattered there, and Jerusalem was destroyed. And the whole book of Lamentations is about Jeremiah interacting with God about this. And tell me if you can't relate to these feelings at times. Joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our heads. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of this, our eyes grow dim. I know I've been in that place a lot. And I try to cover it with a number of the different things that I mentioned earlier. And we have to understand that when God is revealing weaknesses and even sinful areas in our lives, he wants to restore us. And Jeremiah knew this because just a verse or so after what I just read you, he finishes off the book by saying, you, O God, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why does it seem like you forget us? Why does it seem like you're forsaking us so long? So restore to us. Oh, restore us to yourself, O oh Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old. The Spirit of the living God this morning is saying that to us, friends. In our place of struggle, anxiety, and stress, and, and, and our place of, of anger, and our place of, of unforgiveness, and our place of all these things, God is saying to us, restore, we're saying, God, restore us to you. Renew us as in the days of old. Thanks for hanging with me, folks. I'm almost done. But in Peter, Peter says it so well. He says, humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you like no one else cares for you. Give these things to him. Again, we have to renew our minds, reminding ourselves that when God shows us areas that need to be repented of or broken, he's doing it as a mercy because he doesn't want us staying in that place, that pit of our lives anymore. And so like Paul, we say, well, I'm going to rejoice when God shows me those things because he wants to bring me to a place of restoration. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? And Peter continues and he says, in the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and steadfast. Not only does he restore us, but now we have the strength to know that our God brought us through something. And we are stronger 
in our walk with him. I remind you of those famous words Jesus said to us, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Why? Because I'll give you rest. Take my yoke. The yoke is what determined what direction the, the oxen moved in. He said, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I'm gentle, humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. And finally, one of the last verses of Revelation, the last verses of the Bible, the Spirit of God and the bride, the church, say, come. And let the one who hears come. Let the one who's thirsty come. And let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life come. And so, friends, true transformation and restoration happens when we embrace brokenness. It builds humility and releases God's restoration power within us. And it brings us to a place where we can read a psalm like was read for us this morning. And we can read it together, and we can read it triumphantly. After what God does in us by setting us free from something he has broken in us, we can then truly say, shout to God, shout to the Lord with joy, all the earth. And I remind you that word shout is the Hebrew word ruah, which means a mighty, powerful declaration. It's like a war cry. That there's something in us that God changes and it builds a shout of worship to him. And it says, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with song. So friends, we approach brokenness this way. We ask God to reveal to us if there's any areas of pride that we have not asked his help to help us with. He shows us and we repent. We have repentance of fear where we were afraid and we are anxious and we didn't trust him. And we give him our faith and we give him our time. And church, I really, with all my heart, believe that if we enter into this process, that we, like Paul, will find this great joy in brokenness and also in restoration. And so knowing that God has given us authority, we will then be able to be released like a mighty army out into a world that decides to handle brokenness with anger, with rage, tearing down statues, ripping apart things. That's all they know how to do because they have no answer. But we are the church friends. We have the answer. And we have to remember that because when we watch all that stuff, it's easy to allow the darkness to cloud our minds. And we say, no, in the name of Jesus, we are the light to cast out that darkness. That is who each of us are, whether we realize it or not, friends. And so as you go out into the world this afternoon and this next week, be beams of light to those who are bound in this darkness and this anger and all the stuff going on around us. For we are the church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.